Good evening, everyone. How are you? Thank you so much. Good to see you all. My name is Pierce Handling. I'm the director and CEO of TIFF, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you tonight to this evening's In Conversation um, with Lee Vollman. To begin with, we'd like to make a few acknowledgments. Tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We're very grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. And on behalf of uh, TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal, Paris, and Visa, and our major public supporters, the Government of Ontario, Telefilm Canada, and the City of Toronto, and our Cinematech supporters, Ontario Creates and the Canada Council for the Arts. Also, a big thank you goes to our members and donors, people like yourself, for supporting our charitable mission of bringing the power of film to life 365 days a year. A big thank you goes to all of you. Now, tonight's event complements two series we're running this season at TIFF. Leave Ullman, Face to Face, which shows a selection of her work as both a writer and a director. I think there's five films in the program. And, of course, Bergman 100, the Ingmar Bergman Centenary, a celebration of the revered Swedish master's work that includes an expansive retrospective of all of his films and television. Following tonight's event, Leave will introduce a screening of Ingmar Bergman's Shame here in this cinema at 9 p.m. We hope we can join you for the screening. It's one of my favorite films, one of the first Bergmans I saw when I was in my teens. Now, Leave Ullman really needs no introduction to many of the people in the audience. She uh, has an association with Toronto. When I was reading, she spent um, very young years, I think she was two to five and a half, during the war, she arrived here in 1940 and left in 44 or 45. And yesterday she spent uh, time wandering around the city trying to find uh, the places that she lived. Um, she started her career in theater and became noted for her portrayal of Nora in Ibsen's A Dollhouse. She started acting in films in 1957 before being famously discovered by Ingmar Bergman who cast her opposite Bibi Anderson in one of the most important films in the history of cinema, Persona. She went on to appear in 10 of his films in some unforgettable roles. She appeared in the films of other directors, notably Jan Troll, and received her first Oscar nomination for Best Actress for her part in his film, The Emigrants, and won the Golden Globe for her performance in this film. She was also nominated for an Oscar for her performance in Bergman's Face to Face. She has received and been nominated for numerous other awards for her performances, many other Golden Globes, the New York Film Critics, the National Board of Review, the BAFTAs, the Donatellas, the National Society of Film Critics. She's also directed five films of her own, two of them from scripts written by Ingmar Bergman. And we presented most of the films she has directed here at our festival, and so it's really wonderful to have us here tonight. Now, before I bring Leave out, I actually want to start with a clip. When I was doing the research for this um, conversation, I, of course, went back through all the films, and I'd completely forgotten this moment. And apparently she had as well, because I showed it to her last night on my phone, and uh, <laughs> she looked at it as if she'd never seen it before. Um, but I think once you see the clip, you'll understand why I actually selected it. So could we please run the first clip? So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Lee Volman. <laughs> so welcome, Leave. Um, we're off script now because uh, I've been spending the last day and a half with Leave, and we went off to um, visit a show at the AGO, Anthropocene, the uh, exhibit, and Leave said to me, we have to talk about this tonight. So before we get to her work with Ingmar, um, I just want I know a number of you have probably seen uh, Jennifer Bechwell, Nick Deponcier's and Ed Bertinsky's film. We showed it at the festival. It's now screening in the building. Um, it's an extraordinary film, of course, about the impact of the, of the human on the planet and what we're actually doing to it. Um, but I just 
walked uh, leave through the show with Nick and with Jennifer, uh, and the curator for the show, and uh, you were you were incredibly moved by this, weren't you, Leif? I was so moved, first of all, to see the destruction that we are all part of, and very often even without knowing it, and what they show, what the nature looks like after our destruction has gone very far. But there were also scenes there which were fantastic, like from Nairobi, Nairobi, Nairobi. Uh, yeah, yeah. In, in Africa, where they made the decision, the government and the people, that no more killing elephants to get the ivory tusks from them. And they took all the tusks they could find and they had a public burning of it and said, no one from here are going to sell ivory tusks anymore. And I think that is so incredible to see and such an example for all of us when so many leaders of the world decide to continue doing bad stuff and Nairobi, who could really need the money, they, they burn and say, no more will we be part of this destruction of live animals. The whole exhibition is fantastic. The movie is fantastic. And I want to remind you, because you're all from uh, Canada and Toronto, that uh, Al Gore got the Nobel Prize in peace for his environmental uh, uh, work. And I believe that these three people may be the next one. I hope so. <laughs> and it comes from Norway. The Peace Prize Nobel comes from Norway. <laughs> <laughs> Where I'm from, yeah. So now we're on to your relationship, your career with um, Ingmar Bergman, one of the great directors. Um, this short film, which is a, a part of Scenes from a Marriage, you're reading this you're from your diary to uh, your husband, Erlan Josephson, um, it's almost a kind of a perfect little introduction to who you were as a child and as a young woman. And I'm just wondering how accurate it is. I mean, it's obviously he wrote this, um, but it's all the photographs of who and what you are. Were you this shy and timid and awkward? And I won't go into some of the other things that were said well, this, there, but... The strange thing is that I have never seen that before because it was made as a TV series uh, in six episodes, and it was a film, and I really only saw the film. I've not seen uh, that uh, clip, except that she was reading close up of her and him sleeping close up of him. But the diary, that is my diary. He asked, can I just see, you know, you make a diary about your upbringing. I never knew what he was going to use it for. And it's too late to tell him now. But <laughs> <laughs> And the pictures he must have gotten from uh, my relatives and so. Yes, it's accurate. It's about me. And maybe that movie, it's not about me really, but I love the movie because it's a strong woman. She's not neurotic and she's uh, weak in the beginning and she starts to see her strength and he divorces her in a, in a terrible way and she grows strong and in the end, when he comes back to her and say, oh, please take me back, take me back. She said, why? Why should I do that? My life is good now and good luck to your life. And, <laughs> and uh, yes, it, it, it's the one movie I really did with Ingmar almost where uh, a kind of timid woman grows and is uh, saying yes to who she is as a woman. Now, you started your career on stage as an actress in Norway, although you spent some time in England. And I'm just wondering, maybe we can talk about your experience as a theater actor and what that brings to film, what you felt um, that prepared you for when you started to work on the films. Maybe the films actually before uh, Ingmar cast you in persona. But what is a theater actor? Um, what kind of training is there that perhaps a pure film actor, some, an actor who doesn't appear on stage, uh, doesn't have? Well, I, I think it is that uh, you are used to see a person, the whole life of that person that you're supposed to show on stage. So when you start, it's not one take and you just show that situation you are in. But in that situation you are in, you also have that story of what that person 
did before and after, and it's the wonderful contact with the audience. And for me then, knowing what it means to really, when you can reach an audience and it's really quiet, quiet uh, there, and you tell a story about somebody and it's like a bridge between the audience and the actor, that you can use in a film because the camera is then the audience and you have no shyness, you just feel it's somebody really alive there. And working with Ingmar, it's not only the camera, he used to stand just by the camera so you had somebody who saw you and heard you and it was tremendously inspiring and that was an incredible audience too. So I think that theater actors sometimes maybe make the best uh, film actors. And of course he worked with a company of actors, the same people time, uh, uh, time after time. Were they also on stage? Were you performing with them in the theater as well as in the films with Ingmar? So you all knew each other, not just as film actors, but also as theater actors? You brought that training into the films? No, because I'm Norwegian and they were all Swedish. So we never worked together on the stage. But I did work with Ingmar on the stage in Norway, once only. But we met each other in the films because uh, we did films Together, Bibi Anderson, my best friend, we did a movie together many years before I met Ingmar and started to work with him. And we became very close, not only Bibi and I, but all the, the women. I, I have a story about that because I also lived with Ingmar for five years. And when it was over, I was very nervous of coming to Sweden because it was big headlines about that, oh, it's over with Liev and Ingmar, and I was, uh, I didn't want to go to Sweden, and, but I had to go to Sweden, and I was in the plane, and, and it was during the war in Vietnam, and when I went off the plane in Stockholm, I was very, very nervous, and a lot of people were standing there with the big, uh, what do you say? Banners? Yes. And I Placards. thought, oh, they are demonstrating no for Vietnam. And then I saw who it was, and it was all my women colleagues. And they said, welcome home, leave, and how good you're coming home. <laughs> <laughs> and we all went home to Bibi Anderson, and all the girls were lying on the floor, and we were drinking red wine, and we talked about when something was over with different uh, men. <laughs> and it was a wonderful <laughs> evening. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's the kind of collegiality we had. And that could also come from stage, because stage actors, because you meet so often, even I went to see them from Norway. Uh, we, we have a bond, good bond. So let's go to the first clip, um, and we can get into discussing some of the films in more detail. So I'll just give you a, a very quick explanation. I'm showing a clip clips from three of the, the first films that Leave did with Ingmar, Persona, Hour of the Wolf, and Shame. So the clip from Persona is taken from a very long scene, a very famous one, between Bibi Anderson and Leave, where the scene is repeated word for word, the uh, first close-up of Leave and the, then a close-up of Bibi. I'm just showing the close-up of, of Leave. And the scene from Hour of the Wolf shows Max von Sydow and Leave grappling with the demons and their relationship. And the moment from Shame is actually not a characteristic moment of the film, the film itself is a pretty harsh and tough film about a couple caught up in a civil war. But this clip shows Mac von Sydow and Leave talking about an imagined future. So could we just run the first clip, or the second clip, please? Maybe we should just start with how you met Ingmar and the impression he left on you the first time you met him. Well, I actually met him uh, on the street. I was in Stockholm to visit Bibi Anderson, and we had worked together, and we were the best of friends. And then he came walking, and he stopped to say hello to Bibi, and he knew he had heard about me. And, and he said, just like they do in movie magazines, he said, would you like to be in one of my movies? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was really red, and I, was, I said yes. And, and then he did send me a script, but that was a movie that was never made, and I had two pages in that uh, movie. And just before it was going to be made, he became ill, 
he often became ill when he didn't want to do something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it was cancelled. And, and Bibi and I, we were so sad and we went on the vacation, we went to Poland and Czechoslovakia and looked at theater. And then when we came to Czechoslovakia, the embassy got hold of us and said, oh, Ingmar is well again and he's <laughs> going to make a movie, but it's another movie he's going to make. <laughs> and uh, that was Persona. And according to Ingmar, uh, while he was in the hospital, he had been looking at pictures of Bibi and me, and he was struck by the likeness of us. And he said he was inspired to make a, a persona, which is a mask in his uh, way of looking at it. One woman being the mask of another woman. And we went right to Stockholm, and he started the movie almost immediately. And I only had one word in the movie. And Bibi was the one talking all the time. And uh, my word was nothing. And that was good because I was very shy to begin with that I was going to work with Ingmar Bergman. And, but it was something about him that I thought I, I understood. And I had a feeling that the person I played, and that was an actress in the middle of her career. I was very young, too young maybe to do it. I was 25 and this was somebody who was almost middle-aged almost. And I had a feeling I was doing him. That refusing to talk, refusing to be part of life, just watching and wondering and feeling really on the outside. Uh, that was Ingmar. And we never discussed it, but my theory is that in many of the movies I did, that movie and later in other movies, I was some kind of a speaker for, for Ingmar. And you saw a scene from per Persona, and it's not that he always has the camera on me, really, because this was a long scene where Bibi Anderson, who was the nurse for, for this lady who didn't want to talk anymore, uh, she is telling the lady, I am thinking that uh, something has happened to you and something with the child. And it's a long scene and the camera is on Bibi. And then he does the other scene where she talks and the camera is on me. And when he saw it in the editing room, he thought, oh, they're both so good. So he improvised. He said, I'll keep everything on her and I'll keep everything on her. And so he made that scene twice because he just couldn't decide whom he wanted to, <laughs> to keep, which was great. And then he merges the image of the two of and, you at the end. And that also happened in the editing room. Uh, while he was sitting looking at the screen and so, suddenly Bibi's face somehow came at the same time as my face was there and they almost came together. And he said, I will put these two faces together like a mask. And he asked Bibi to come to the editing room and she saw this one face, half me, half Bibi. And Bibi said, oh my God, leave, but she's speaking, how strange. And I came into the editing room or saw it. I said, oh, that's Bibi. We could not recognize ourselves in the two halves of our faces, which is very interesting. Uh, so and both these scenes became very famous, but they didn't happen while we were doing the movie. They, they actually happened while he was editing the movie. And for Ingmar, it was fantastic because he was at the crossroad in his life. He was, uh, he, things changed for him. And I think there was a lot of things that had happened in his childhood and so, and uh, very much adds for this movie is a boy, a little boy, which is Ingmar. Mm. And looking at the face of this woman and this face could be Bibi's face and my face together. And he, with his hand, he's over the face and over the face, like he's seeking for a mother, somebody who will give him safety. And the way he looked upon it, his mother did not give him that safety. And so many of Ingmar's movies are about this little boy, this young boy, 
looking for safety. And what he wrote somewhere in one of his books, the, the evil of the humankind is when the humankind is indifferent and cold and doesn't care about anyone else. And you will find that in almost all his movies. He can show cold people, but he's begging that these cold people will turn and feel compassion and contact with, with other people. He talks in his book about his childhood. You're right. I mean, he actually, in The Magic Lantern, he writes up quite a bit about it. Did you talk to him when you were in, in your relationship a lot about his childhood? Did he constantly return to that as yes, something it, that troubled him, that scarred him, or what, or what, what is the right well, words to use Well, he here? always said that he had a difficult childhood and it was difficult with the contact with, with his mother and, and father. I never met his mother, but I met his father and he was a priest, and everybody who knew the father really loved the father. But Ingmar made three movies which were really about his mother and his father, and he loved his mother, but they didn't really have that contact. And he said his father was very, very cold. And I actually directed the last script of his... Uh, family, which was about the mother and about the father. And the strange thing was that this mother that he always loved, and you will find it in many of his movies, just before he wrote that movie, which is about the mother having a lover, and she was the wife of a priest. This is private confessions. This is private yeah. confession. And he found that out not after the mother died. They found In a her diary. diary. Or letter. Exactly. They found her diary, and nobody knew that she had had a lover. And he gave me a, a diary, a book that the mother had, had written. And he wrote in his own diary about the mother he loved and the mother he always described beautifully. In the book he wrote, he had a picture of the mother and he had an arrow pointing to the mother. You are an actress. You fooled all of us, which was very strange. And I also read uh, in that uh, diary that his father had written her such beautiful love stories and they never divorced. They, they came together again. And, and the mother says in the end of the movie, uh, she says, my husband loved me more than I ever knew how to love back again. So what he made in the movie was more a memory and it didn't click with the truth that he known. New. Is this difficult to get? Yeah. It is. <laughs> well, you should see the movie, Private yeah, yeah. Confessions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to Persona. How difficult was it for you as an actress to perform a role where you have one line of dialogue? I mean, this is a remarkable performance. It really is. Um, you have no access to dialogue at all. Everything is just expressed in your face and your body. Um, I mean, just how... how this is your first film with an extraordinary filmmaker. How easy was that? Or, or was it easy or was it incredibly challenging? No, it was almost easy because I had never had a director who stands by the camera and is your audience and, and he sees what you are trying to do because Ingmar always believed that an actor is uh, creative and for me it was good because I was very shy and since I was Norwegian and didn't speak Swedish very well if I had added a lot of lines it would be you know <laughs> maybe not so very good but I had my face and 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 that I could use and I had this man standing by the camera and he could read he even wrote you know I told leave that you know he wrote in his book magic uh, whatever it's called, his biography, 
He said, I told her she's listening to Bibi Anderson telling a long erotic story. And I can't believe it because I'm seeing her face and her lips become big and her eyes are strange and I don't know how she does it with the face. And I saw the movie. I didn't see my lips got big and whatever. But, <laughs> but that's the way he made you feel. So maybe they did get bigger, but... He writes about that. Was, that was going to be my next question. He said, yes. put all your feelings in this scene into Except, your lips. Yes. And I, I didn't put them into my lips. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that is the thing, because the way he describes something in the script... I, it was another movie I did not so long after, and it was the longest close-up in that time that was done on a movie. It was like... 10 minutes long. And I am telling my husband, it, uh, this was uh, a Passion of Anna, the movie was called. And I'm telling my second husband, my first marriage, it was beautiful and we loved each other so much and it was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And, and the husband says, you are lying. And Ingmar says in the script, she's lying. But I believed what she was telling was the truth. And I was going to show him now in this shot of 10 minutes close up that she is talking the truth. But his lines are so incredible that although I was trying to convince him through his words that I was telling the truth, my knowledge of it being a lie happened to me. And I can see when I saw the shot that I became red. I started to become red. I started to cry. Things happened to me. And that is the magic of working with an incredible director who is also an incredible writer. Because while you do it, the truth in the writing is coming through. And so that was a woman who was lying, although I had decided I would show him it is the truth. Did he talk to you a lot about how to shape your roles? Or maybe you can just talk a little bit about the working method with Ingmar. Did you rehearse a lot? Did you do numerous takes? Um, did you talk about the roles? How did that all happen, Leif? Well, some movies we had uh, long rehearsals, a week or two. I know a movie with Ingrid Bergman, Autumn Sonata, we had two weeks of rehearsals. Uh, other movies, for example, Persona, no, no rehearsals. Uh, before a take, we would have a kind of blocking rehearsals where one would sit and maybe go to a window and so. But he would never, never say, this is what you feel and you take a pause and your heart is hammering and this is what you think. Only bad directors do that. Ingmar never, never said what you felt on the inside because he was also excited to see what an actor can create because he believed actors are creative too. He gave them the words. He, he gave them uh, the atmosphere, you know, being inspiring, being this incredible audience, and then you, you did it. But the script was sacrosanct, right? He never allowed you to... Never, never allowed to change a word. Never, I, never. Uh, I, I, in Face to Face, I was to commit a suicide on myself. And the background for that was she comes to her home where she grew up as a little child and she's sitting on the bed and she decides she's going to make a suicide. And that was more or less what he said uh, with the pills. And just before the camera goes, I hear him say to somebody, you took out uh, you know, the sleeping pills and put some vitamin pills, didn't you? And he wanted me to hear it. And I knew he was lying. I knew he was bluffing. But I thought, oh, this is inspiring. Maybe they forgot. And, and so, so that was kind of inspiring. So the camera starts, and I'm sitting on the bed, and, and there is the bottle with the pills. 
and I always shivered on my hand and it started to shiver a, a little more and I thought, oh, this looks good. I, I hope he sees so well I'm doing this. And then I don't like to take pills, so I took one or two and then I thought, no, probably she takes a lot to make it over with very quickly. And she took all the pills and he didn't say stop, so I had to continue and, and the bottle fell on the floor and I thought, oh, so that was a good thought. It fa falls on the floor. And I looked at the bottle and he didn't say stop and so I well maybe she's tired now and so she she lied down on 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 the bed and he, he didn't say stop and I was lying there and there you see that's a master director because there was the tapestry from when I was a little child his idea and it's the tapestry when I was a little child and maybe as a child I was you know feeling on the tapestry before I go to sleep and and I, I thought that's that's good and my hand was shivering a little and things went slowly and and then she couldn't do that anymore and he didn't say stop and and, and then she looked at the watch to see what time she died and and then, and then she got closed her eyes and he said stop and the only thing he said after you know no I don't have to commit suicide anymore because <laughs> no I've seen it but that's the kind of director he gave you the atmosphere and he allowed you to create and that's why he worked with the same actors all the time because he knew that they kind of loved it except Ingrid Bergman she didn't like that way of, of, of working we'll talk about that in a little yes. bit when I show you the clip when I show the clip um, the scene from shame that I sh that we sh selected here was that I think last night you said it was an imp one of the few moments where he actually allowed you as actors to improvise it was the only time I think that we improvised and he wanted to show before the war came and destroy them as human beings, how happy they were and how much in love they were. And it, there was no text, he said, just leave you talk about that you'd like a child. And, and he said, shall we do it now and whatever, but just end up with that you fall from the table and fall down on the, on the ground. And, and we, did that and uh, and he loved it and that was only one take actually that he did but I think very much he was on the woman because he wanted to show that this was a woman who really really believed in life who believed in having a child and this was the man who was there for her wanting to be with her wanting to be part of the strength and the warmth that she had. And then the war comes and uh, war doesn't only explode with guns and terrorism and so, what war also does, it changes people completely. So violence starts to enter these films. I mean, Hour of the Wolf, the clip that I selected, Max von Sydow with the gun, and of course shame, even though it's not really a representative clip, I mean, you're right, it's all about a civil war, and of course there's violence between this couple. Um, was he going through a very difficult moment in terms of trying to work through these issues of marriages, couples, the violence within these couples? I think again it was this coldness that scared him, the coldness that, that we allow into our own life who we are or who other people was. He used to call the shame, shame the dream of shame. That used to be its title. And, and the next movie he did was The Passion of, of Anna. And the two of them really are bound together. And he was very socially, uh, he, was, he was caring for what happened. He was caring for the... Vietnam War, he showed even in persona, he showed scenes from it, but nobody kind of accepted that. They said he doesn't care about the world he is living it, although it's clear in the movie. And in uh, The Passion of Anna, the, there were a lot of demonstrating and so in everywhere, and then his whole team, uh, his technical team, they 
they made a strike, you say strike? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They went on they strike? Made a strike, and they said, we will not work anymore if we are not part of all your artistic choices. And what? They were going to, whatever he was going to do, he had to ask them, can we do it this way or that way artistically? And, uh, and he said, well, I'm sad that's not going to happen, and those who don't want to be on the movie anymore, you can leave. <coughs> and only one person left, and the other stayed there. So he even had a, a kind of revolution on his set for two movies that were so against war and so against what was happening in the world at that time. So let's move to um, the next series of clips because you've just started to talk about passion. Um, so we're showing three clips here. One is, the first one is from Passion, also known as The Passion of Anna. And this clip comes very close to the end of the film when the couple's relationship <coughs> is breaking down, as you will see. Showing a clip from in Cry, uh, Cries and Whispers where um, Leave and Ingrid Thulin, two of the sisters who've gathered around a sickbed of another one of their sisters, interact. And then a scene from Scenes from Marriage where Leave is told by her husband, played by Erlen Josephson, that he is leaving her for another woman. Clips, please. You don't look happy. Um, should I start with a question? He's one of the most famous directors of close-ups in the history of cinema, if not the most famous. Uh, I mean, it's extraordinary. He obviously loved the close-up, and he scrutinized his actors, and he had extraordinary performances. I'm just wondering, Leif, how difficult that was for you, how you retain your concentration. I mean, some of these scenes, it was very difficult for me because you're, they're actually very long extended sequences, as you said. You know, some of them are four or five minutes. The scene from Cries and Whispers goes on for a much longer period of time. How easy was this for you as an actor to have a camera um, looking at every single emotion, I guess, every single whatever? How, 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 what was that like? Well, it's so incredible described in this script somehow where she is the two women there in the middle it's two sisters and one sister is completely scared of contact with people Ingrid Tulin and the other one is so selfish but she likes to do certain things, and that is me, and the one description of me in the script is, this is a woman who never cared to close a door after her. She just went and never closed the door after her. Of course, it is wonderful when the sister me wants to wake up the sister and caresses her and has the time to do it. And it takes the time to carry somebody who doesn't want to give contact. And suddenly it happens and the person she's caressing is opening up more and more. It's, it's wonderful. And to know in the end that the person I am will then leave the sister and not think about what she had just done. And then the scene with the husband in the bed who's telling her our marriage is over. And then he's saying those terrible things. And she gets new lines where she says, how long have you been thinking about this? I mean, why doesn't she stop talking? But we don't stop talking when we are in situations like that. And, and he tells her these gruesome things. It's, it's wonderful. That's why you aren't acting, because you get the way of showing what is happening in all of us, whether we are good or bad or do good things or do bad things. And it gives us the way of also corresponding with the audience because it is a close-up. And if you are really real, somehow something in that close-up will remind the audience of something that also happened to you or something that you made 
happening to other people. It, it's, it's good. So where does this authenticity come from then? I mean, you're, you're so close. He's framing you so closely. And any kind of falseness, I think an audience, as you've just said, would detect that. So how do you, it's a very fine line to walk as an actor, I'm sure, between inventing something and being really authentic. Well, you must believe in it. And because it's so beautifully written and, and you have this man that really will recognize what you do and that makes you want to do more than you thought you could do. I, I would almost compare it with if you are with someone that you really love and you are very close to that person and you see each other's eyes, something opens up in you that only that person will recognize. And that is the same thing you feel as an actress because it is you. I'm, you know, there, there are different kinds of actors. And I think Ingmar's actors are using very much of who they are or things that they didn't know about themselves that they, they can find while they are doing this scene. So it it's like you and something else that, that comes through if you really believe in it. So it's like total exposure then? Yes, total exposure, but in a, in a, in a good way. Somehow. Did you find this with other directors when you were working with other directors? Jan Twell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with with some. With some, and and because you had trust from the director, obviously with Ingmar and with some others, but it's seldom, and that is part of of his uh, genius. Uh, I think, and that's why he makes these movies that is not talking to your mind or your intellectualism or whatever. It's talking to your soul, really, and and the reality which is behind the reality that we don't talk about. That something where movies are so incredible because. That's one of the few places today where we can sit together and we can experience something together. And it is true because we recognize it. We live in a world with so little contact at times and there's so much lies and so uh, that we are hearing. But in movies, if it is a good movie, uh, you need that contact. It's not this phone thing. It's, it's opening up to something. You've written, I think, in your book, your wonderful autobiography, about striking an inner balance between technique and intuition. And maybe this is what you're talking about. But maybe you could just talk a little bit more about that. If I'm not, the, the, this balance between technique, I guess, the skills you have as an actor, and intuition. What, what do these two words mean for you, I guess, Leif, when you wrote this, and what does that mean? The truth, it's very important for me in my work to be truthful, and sometimes it's very difficult because directors don't always want that. They want some outer thing. You know, a bad director will will say you come in and your heart is beating and all of that. And once he said all those things, it's very difficult to do it. But you know with people, when you really feel, uh, I have a friend, it's when two people really are together and they talk together and they are open together. And it's suddenly so wonderful to to live, we are here together. And why I'm saying that is that that is not something that always happens. Either, you know, it's very intellectual or it's gossiping or it's, it's so many things. But when truth happens, you, you do, uh, yeah. 
Can I tell a story? <laughs> Please do. And, and it doesn't have to do with acting, but it has to do with the truth somehow. And it has to do with my grandmother. And it happened so long ago. And with my grandmother, it happened even, you know, 70 years ago. And, and we were very close. And, 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 and whatever she told me, I would really understand. And, and what I told her, she would understand. And I would fall asleep there on her lap. And, and, and the smell here in her neck, that was the truth for me. It was the absolute safety. And never in my life later did I find that smell, which was the absolute safety. We are together right now. And then so long after, and I was working with uh, refugees, and I came to Macau. And, and this is what happened. Uh, there were refugees from Vietnam there. And we visited them. And then behind a fence, it says, these are for people with leprosy. And I wasn't going to go in there. And the priest came, and he kind of pushed me in. So I had to go in. And on the other side of the fence was lying a woman. And she was crying. And she was eaten up a little in her face and her, her hands. And I couldn't do anything, although she was crying. And the priest was still there, and he pushed me again. And so I bent down, and I took her and held her. And she stopped crying. <laughs> and she made that sound that little children do. And she smelled like my grandmother here. No, that is the truth that I know if I'm to do anything acting-wise, if I can come there and I can recognize my grandmother and the best times in my life, and I'm not going to lie now, uh, that's the kind of actor that I want to be. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And and that's what I mean with a couple, too. And that's yes. Very well put. Um, not only was he a great director who used the close-up, he's probably so famous for his portraits of women. Uh, he has this extraordinary reputation. There's so many wonderful performances by male actors, of course, but he's really, I think, remembered for the way he used actresses like yourself, Ingrid Tulin, Harriet Anderson, Bibi Anderson, Gunnar Lundblom. I'm just wondering, w w this, this incredible affinity he had for women, um, what's happening there? What, what, what insight did he have as a male into the female world? Well, what he really said plainly was that women were not so shy about being naked. And I don't mean bodily, but in their faces. There is no shame in crying. There's no shame in showing anger. There's no shame. Women undress more easily their faces, whereas males at time don't want to leave the macho or... I know because I've, I've worked with, you know, famous Hollywood actors and they don't like close-ups. Whereas close-ups is your opportunity to be close to the truth. And, and, and that is what he... Uh, he said, although he found some men like Max von Sydow and Erland Josephson, but very often you will still feel they are protecting certain things with themselves. Whereas the actresses, and look at what Gunnar Lindblom and, 
and Ingrid Tulin and Harriet Anderson and Bibi Anderson did. Uh, it's incredible when you look at their work and especially with, with Ingmar. We want so much to give contact and I know men do that too, but... Uh... Was he demonstrative? Was he... Did he have that female side of him, or was he really reserved and controlled? Or was no. he just a kind of a very complex man who had both sides? He was very open. He was not violent, and you will see a lot of violence in his movie. He was not a violent man. He could become very angry, but not violent. He loved connection. Uh, we did um, the uh, Faithless. Faithless. We did Faithless, and he was not allowed on the set because he would then start to control, and I was directing it. It was his uh, script, and he was not allowed <laughs> because I'm so scared if he came, you know, then I, he'd suddenly take over. So he was not allowed. But the last day, he was to come. And it would be a surprise for the actors that he was coming. And in the lunch, when we, it was lunch, he came and, he, and we were going to do a scene with uh, Lena Endre and her husband were going to meet in a hotel room in a, in a, in a bed. And, and he came and, oh, it's this. And then he said, oh, I'm going to hide. I mean, he's very childish, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to hide. And, and then he went to the bed and he put the cover over himself. And he was going to lie there till Lena Endre came in. <laughs> And she comes in and she sees the cover goes up and down because he's laughing of this thing. And I mean, that is like a woman would do, you know. Not a famous genius director is lying in bed and the cover goes up and down because he's laughing. And that is, uh, he, he recognized that. And, and that's why he was also so good to describe, I think, women's kind of... Uh, Emotion. This is childish, but it's... Um, do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the film... Did, did he have a sense of humour? Because oh. the film... Did he have a really strong oh, sense of humour? He had a wonderful sense of humour. He's the happiest sets I've been on. Ab absolutely the happiest sets I've been. Sometimes he could, could get angry, but seldom at the actors, because they had to perform in front of the camera. But... Uh, it was a joy to be on, on his sets. And everybody will say that who's worked with him. No one who worked with him of actors or working close with him would say anything but uh, he was fun, he enjoyed it like uh, a young boy. And then he would be serious just before we would do the, the scene. Apparently there were a lot of laughs on Cries and Whispers, despite the fact that it's such a serious film. Oh, yeah, and he didn't like that because we were so many women in that movie, and we were all good friends. And, and we did it in a castle, and we more or less were also living, had rooms in that uh, castle. And, and uh, he more or less said, because, uh, you know, I think, you know, when the day is over and you have a dinner, you should all go to your room and you should study your, your parts and, and so. And so we pretended we went to our rooms, all the women, <laughs> and Ingmar went to his room and so felt happy. And he didn't know we all came out and we were having a wonderful time during the night and we drank and gossiped and, and once we thought we'd tell him the truth, something about what we thought about men and maybe, <laughs> you know, for his next movie. <laughs> and, and we banged on the door, you know, and he, and he never opened. And, <laughs> and he told us after he got so scared, you know, he had four women banging on the door <laughs> and no, you will know the truth. So he jumped out of the window and, and he couldn't come in again. So he had to go to a hotel for the night. <laughs> <laughs> but he enjoyed it. He would tell that story to everybody. He thought that was a great story. 
he once described you as his Stradivarius. It was an incredible compliment. And um, yeah. I'm just wondering what you think um, you brought to him as a director when, with a compliment like that. I mean, that's an extraordinary compliment. You're his, an instrument that he can play. And of course, the Stradivarius is the best instrument in the world. You know what my daughter wrote in a book that's coming out now in, in January in, here in America? Um, <laughs> she wrote, oh my, it, it's a kind of biography. And she wrote, oh my mother, she's so proud that Ingmar said she was a Stradivarius. She doesn't know that there are many bad Stradivariuses too. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so it is in the family. <laughs> but uh, it is the truth because I, I'm truthful and he liked that. I'm truthful in my work and he needed that and he needed that for the movies he was he was going to do and i think in many of the movies i was in some ways uh, portraying him too somehow we we understood each other we 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 are not alike but we understood each other very well all our lives he used this phrase, you're painfully connected, I think. Yeah. Well, that was kind of smart of him because that was in persona and before we knew each other very well, it was, we were doing the movie and, and you know, I, I kind of fell in love, but he, of course, shouldn't know that. And, and I think he fell in love with me in one of the last days, but we had never talked about that. We, and we were all walking on the beach and so, and then Ingmar and I was sitting on a stone and looking at the water and we did the whole thing on an island. And then he said, I had a dream last night that you and I, we are painfully connected. And that was so beautiful. And, and that's how we knew that when the movie was over, we probably would continue to be together also as a couple. And we were, we, we lived together for three movies or two movies, and, but the rest was a fantastic artistic, being together artistically, being together as friends, being together as uh, parents, uh, it is wonderful when you find somebody you can work together with until one of them dies. And we can still do that. And you did. Um, there's some wonderful scenes here, just in the clips, about with the use of hands. The persona clip, and of course the clip from uh, Cries and Whispers. And you are a very touchy person. You sort of, you, you are, you're very physical. And I'm just wondering, it's, it's such an ex extraordinary moment, actually, that he has in his films with just the use of hands, people touching, and uh, of course, completely visual and um, without any dialogue. Yes, but look at hands. Hands are very important when you are with people. Not so much always now when you always have a phone here, but <laughs> but before. And uh, I also have a memory, actually, when I was in Toronto and my father died here when I was uh, six years old. And I, don't, I don't, don't remember him, but I do remember us walking on the road and we were holding hands and, and he did like, this, that is such a beautiful memory. And my hand in yours and my hand for you and hands are terrifically important. And Ingmar used it a lot. I used it a lot when I directed. And, and he had this wonderful memory of his mother and I, I met him that day when his mother died, and that was in the beginning of our relationship. And he had just been in the hospital to visit his mother, and I came to Stockholm from Oslo, 
and he met me and he said, my, my mother died today and he cried and then he said and the most incredible thing was uh, she had started to paint her her fingernails and she had done like one on the little finger and then obviously she hadn't done it anymore and he will never forget that hand with the one painted fingernail and he used it in some films and I, I used it mm. too because it's so beautiful. We are in the middle of our life and we don't know when it's going to be over but there's always a fingernail or something we have started to do and then we cannot finish it. Let's move to the final clip reel. Um, so the next scenes are from it's just two films. One is from Autumn Sonata, where you play the daughter of a famous concert pianist who's obviously played by Ingrid Bergman. And in, in this scene, the mother, Ingrid Bergman, is visiting you and um, her husband. And the final sequence is from Faithless, one of the two films that you directed from screenplays written by Ingmar. And this film focuses on a woman who leaves her husband for another man, agonizing over the effects it has had on her young daughter. Can I... You know, just what I said about the truth, and it's easier to say it about somebody else. That actress there, Lena Endra, she's a theater actress, incredible, and film actress, incredible. And, and she actually, in that time, was also in a personal uh, divorce. And she was doing that scene, and and her little child is being told that the mother is leaving her for a while to move with another man. And, and then the child takes off the shawl that belonged to the mother and walks out of the room. And, and she did that scene. And when she did it the first time, it was incredible. And the whole staff, technical staff, and so they applauded. She, she was so wonderful. But I knew something more was there, the truth in Lena Endre. And I said, what you did is incredible, incredible. But there's one thing you have to think of when you are doing it, and that is that for the rest of your life, that little behind of your child that walks out of the room without turning will be with you for the rest of your life. And you know that, Lena. And then she did it one more time, and I just think it is so fantastic. It's an actress, yes, but it's the truth, and people will recognize it. And that is really what I mean. You don't see that in so many movies, what she did there. And the other thing was, of course, with Ingrid Bergman and the daughter, and you know, she was a pianist and she had been away from home when I was a child and, and I was angry at the mother for that. But I knew how to play uh, piano and I thought I knew that. And when the mother comes for a visit, I want to show her how well I played. <laughs> And then the mother said, oh, that's really very nice, but no, I will show you. And she was a pianist and she played. And the daughter turns towards the mother and, uh, yeah, she didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of your greatest screen roles, I think. You are so different in that film in every kind of way. The way you move, I mean, there's a sequence I wish I could have shown, where you move so differently. You're so kind of timid and hesitant. And of course, the way your hair is done and the glasses, I mean, everything is so perfect to show a character quite different than any other film role I think you've, I've seen uh, of the films you did with Ingmar. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you say that because that happens to be true. Because both Ingrid and I, we were working and we were mothers and uh, Ingrid, not me, because I, I did what Ingmar said. She said, you know, you have to change some lines because why is she so bad just because she's working? Uh, I mean, he, he worked all his life and nobody said he was a bad parent. 
which he was, but but you know, <laughs> but but Ingrid, she protested, uh, and uh, you don't touch the words, you cannot change the words, but so we dressed, and the way you say, I dressed with you know these kind of glasses and. Uh, Yes, I moved because I was restricted because my mother had always been away and so so he said you can do things but you cannot change the words. But Ingrid did not say that and that's why they didn't work well together. Already at the reading, first reading, she stopped. But I, I can't say that. I, I, I can't say that. And Ingmar became more and more quiet. And, and when the reading was over and everybody had gone, he asked me to stay. He said, I can't do that. How can I do this? And Donald, no, Donald, Ingmar, you are, you are the best actress uh, you have to work with, no? Ingrid Bergman. And so he did it. But she always asked him, can't we change? Can't we change? And he, he wouldn't change. And he really was very upset with her. And I sat there and I was so proud to be a woman. I never dared to say those things. But she was doing it and she was fantastic. And then came the, can I tell that story? The big crisis. Uh, because the daughter, as you see, she's very angry at the mother. And so in the middle of the movie, it's night, and the daughter suddenly decides to tell her. The daughter is 40 years old, and the mother is still blamed for her being awkward and unhappy and so, because the, she was a pianist. And so the daughter decides, no, the mother is going to hear who she has been. And the daughter, which is me, 40 years old, she has three pages of monologue towards the mother. How could you leave and how could you leave me alone and look what has happened to me and my life has been so unhappy and terrible. And I loved it. I thought, oh no, she's really going to hear it. And then in the end, the mother has some lines like, oh, please hold around me, please. Please love me, and so. And I thought that was beautiful too. And if I was to do it, you know, people would cry and so. But so we did everything on me first, and uh, because I had all the lines, and then the camera is turned towards Ingrid Bergman, and she's to say these beautiful words. And Ingrid said, I am not going to say that. I want to smack her in the face and leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> And that was the end. And they screamed, and they went on and on screaming. And then they went out in the corridor, and we heard them scream out there. And we thought, no, the movie's ending. No, it's really ending. And suddenly, the screaming stopped, and in they come. And the, the genius and the actress, and she was quiet. He won, of course. <laughs> but then she does this thing, you know. She says, you know, Please hold around me, please love me. But in her eyes are the eyes of every woman who said, I'm so sorry, excuse me for being, I'm so sorry, I will try to do it differently. Uh, no, it wasn't that in her eyes. In her eyes was the anger of having again to say, please love me, and so it was such hate, such anger. It was incredible, an incredible, there, Ingrid Bergman came very, very close to the truth. And she was nominated for an Oscar, not the least for her reaction to this uh, scene. But the two of them never <laughs> became friends. <laughs> and that wasn't Ingrid's problem. She was truthful, but as a person, and didn't want to do it as an actress. When you see the documentary on Ingrid, which was done a couple of years ago, I think by Stig Borkman, um, she was such an independent figure, and she actually abandoned two families. And I always wondered whether... She wasn't abandoning them. Well, the, the children, you know, it's, it's sort of a funny relationship with her children, because she just took off they and did things. So she was very close. independent. They were so close. She didn't. You see, that is the rumor. She went to Italy to make a movie. And, okay, so she fell in love with Rossellini. Well, that was bad, because she had a, a dentist who she had supported for him to be a dentist and a daughter in America. And she fell in love, and that was public. And she was denied 
to come back to America. She was denied. She uh-huh. wasn't allowed to come back to America. And she asked for her daughter. Her husband would not send the daughter. Now, that is the truth. Let's talk about... She didn't <laughs> abandon them. <laughs> I know. And I saw the, the movie about her. Uh, you know, that the, the children were part of. The children loved her. The children loved her. They came to visit her when she was doing this. The children, when the premiere of the documentary about Ingrid Bergman was there, all the children were there. They went around and asked people, isn't she wonderful? Isn't she great? It's great children too, because they accepted that, well, her life was different, but she always showed them love and they knew they were loved. She did not abandon them. Let's talk about Faithless. How? Um, how easy or difficult was it for you to be given the two scripts and to make a film um, by the master filmmaker? Um, it was good because he he kept away from the studio in both of them. And before, while we were preparing the preparing the first one, uh, Private Confession, his wife died. And he came up to the studio where we were and preparing, and and he, and he told us that his wife had died that day. And he he went to the island, and but he was very much part when I was editing the movie because I was doing that on the island where he was living, and he had a lot of you know comments on things I had done, and sometimes, obviously, I mean, this man is a genius. It was good comments on editing choices, and other times it was not, and I didn't agree with him. And I wasn't like Ingrid Bergman, but I cried, you know, and said, please, I, I, I need that ending like this. And because I cried, I got to have the ending that I, <laughs> I wanted. <laughs> so so uh, that worked. With uh, Faithless, uh, I didn't want him at the editing either because I knew, you know, I can't cry for this one because this one I really, really believe in. And he saw it when it was finished. And that was upsetting to him, maybe, probably. Yeah, I'm sure it was. (laughs) (laughs) But... uh, And I had a scene there that I was very proud of and it was about Ingmar and he said it's not about me but why do you call him Bergman I couldn't think of another name (laughs) Uh, and 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 I was allowed to do it in his workroom in Gotland and everything was the way it was when he was writing a movie and so and what I had in the movie was and I was very proud of that, that the old Bergman, which wasn't him, which of course was him, uh, he sits there at his table where I've seen him so many times sitting and writing and working and looks at the watch and then goes over to the window and it's on an island and he looks out and he sees the ocean and everything. And we turn the camera and what does he see on the beach? It's it's uh, Bergman in my movie, Alan Josephson. And I thought that was so authentic and right. That was the one thing he said. And we were invited to Con- Cannes Festival for the competition. He said, if you have that scene in, um, uh, I'm going to say you can't go to Cannes with it. I would tell them I'm against it, that they won't want to film there then. And so I took out that scene and... and uh, and then when I came back from Cannes, he said, I rethought really thought that I think you're right. And that scene came in again. But the strange thing about this, and I don't know how that happened, because two years after he came with a documentary about himself that he himself had, of course, directed with a, a, a photographer, And in the documentary, he's sitting at his writing table. 
and he looks at the watch and he goes to the window and he looks out and what does he see on the beach? He sees Ingmar Bergman. And I still do not know if this was an idea he always had had and that's why he was so angry that I had it in my movie or if it was plainly that he stole from me. <laughs> <laughs> he stole from you. Okay. Let's open it up to the audience now for questions. Um, who may maybe have the lights up just a little bit, and I think there's microphones that are going to be passed around. So let's start right here in the middle. If we can get a microphone to you, that would be fantastic. Uh, either of you. Hi, Liv. Thank you so much for coming. It's been fantastic to hear your process and thoughts on the theater and the contemporary uh, landscape. I just have a quick question about um, your role as a jury member at uh, Cannes in 2001 when you picked uh, Nanny Moretti's The Sun's Room. And uh, what was the process behind that? If you can share post-Cannes, any deliberations? And um, what were your thoughts on Mulholland Drive in particular and um, why that wasn't picked or anything? And maybe just your experience as a member during that. I, Did you hear all of that? So you were on the jury can yeah. in 2001. Mulholland Drive. Mulholland, how, what do you think about Mulholland Drive and why did you pick Nanny Moretti's son's room as the prize Why did I? Why, why did the jury choose Nanny Moretti's son's room as the um, prize winner? Well, Mulholland Drive was good. I, I shouldn't really talk about the discussion, but the, the picture that won the prize was really a movie I loved a lot, uh, and most of the jury did. Uh, there was, uh, Haneke was there, and it was an incredible, some people wanted that movie to, to win, but we gave it to the leading actress in his movie, The Pianist. But it has to be something that most of the jury agrees on. But I have to say that I really wanted the winner to win. <laughs> are, are you from that movie? So you are kind of <laughs> angry at me now. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi there. Um, you were talking about Persona. Persona is obviously well known for its shattering of film and its modernism, the fact that you're separated from the film. What, as a performer on that film, especially because that was one of your earliest works with Bergman, what on earth was that like, making a film like that where there's virtually like not much of a linearity for the most part? It's like a shattering of a film and, you know, it's not a typical film. What was that process kind of like as a performer, especially one, again, that barely had any lines to work with? Did you say it was modernistic too? Yeah. Yes. Don't forget, it's uh, 54 years ago. <laughs> so uh, that it seemed to be like that, it just shows that he was kind of very modern for so long ago. And, and I didn't know, we never saw Rush as the actor, so I didn't know it would really have that look. But it was kind of a break for movies because nobody had made a movie like that. And for him it was incredible because uh, they questioned at times now in Sweden if he would get money for more movies because they didn't always make a lot of money. And with that movie he kind of came back into being very well sought out and as it turned out it became a tremendously famous movie, but we never thought that, we who were part of it, to be honest. Ingmar never thought about it. And I have a picture at home with Ingmar, Bibi, Anderson, and me, where it says, we playmates from Forda in, when was it, 1956 or something. And that's how we looked at that movie, you know. Nobody will really see it, but we had incredibly fun. We can go right here. Let me get a microphone to Leon. We'll go to you next. Right here first. Hello, thank you. 
your, your passion is infectious. It's just incredible. It's no wonder we all love you on the screen. It really is remarkable. I just feel I'm having an intimate conversation with you. I think everyone here does. It's really remarkable. Just something you said last night about Bergman wanting to uh, be a writer. This is uh, three of his screenplays. And I read the foreword to one of them and a letter he wrote to the cast and crew of Passion of Anna. His writing, as you said, is unbelievable. And I want to read more of that. Uh, Persona had a profound influence on me uh, when I made my first film, Dancing in the Dark. Uh, I think there was a lot of influence from him in that. I think Pierce would agree. And the question I had is, in Faithless, uh, I noticed there was a projector in the room behind the glass. It was obviously Bergman's 16 millimeter projector. I wonder what were his influences? Uh, so many people have been influenced by him. I'm just wondering what films did he watch and what directors influenced him cinematically? Uh, he, he loved to watch uh, movies and he always got, uh, because he moved to the island in our time, he built a house and he had Swedish film industry send him movies all the time. And he did see uh, all kinds. Uh, but he was very tied up to really, really old movies. He liked to see very old movies, also silent movies. And then he was impressed by uh, the modern movies and where they could use, have a lot of money and could uh, have big scenes that he would have loved to do because he didn't have that money. And he, after he did uh, Shame, he said, of course, Shame was difficult to do because he didn't have the money to show what a war looks like. And if he had, maybe Shame would have been different in the first half of it. Uh, I'm a f he didn't really have a favorite uh, that I can say, but he also, of course, admired tremendously the Kurosawa and Fellini and those that worked at the same time as him and Antonioni. Uh, he, he, but he loved movies as a whole. I, I, I do not dare to now say what was his favorite movie because I don't think I know what was his favorite movie. Over here. Hi there. Uh, it's been said about the 60s and 70s that there was a mini renaissance at the time. And I, I wonder if you'd agree with that. And I wonder too if art house and mainstream were closer together at that time than, than you'd think now. So there was a, a, a renewal of cinema in the 60s and 70s, the renewal of cinema in the 60s and 70s. And was there more of a, an alignment between art house cinema and mainstream cinema at that point in time? Well, that was also a time where they started to criticize Ingmar in Sweden, you know, uh, some bad reviews and, and so because uh, the new movies also in Sweden, they seem to the reviewers and critics to be uh, something that they wanted more and the new directors did not admire him and also was very public uh, about that. Uh, yeah, he was sort of considered old fashioned a bit in that he point. He was time, considered he? old fashioned and and people were very verbal about that in in the newspapers writing and so uh, and and he got some bad reviews can i tell that story <laughs> it's a wonderful story yes because i told it to him yesterday and and he really he wasn't treated nicely for two or three or four years both by the new directors and wonderful directors, Bo Wiedeberg and so, that nobody talks about that much any longer, but they still talk about Ingmar. Uh, and it was the passion of Anna, I think it was, and he was 
very nervous for that because he didn't want any more bad writing. And, and we were living on the island and he was driving me to the airport and it was like an hour's drive and we, uh, and on the way he bought Express and one newspaper and he said maybe we should read this and we stopped and I opened it and it was a terrible review and uh, and I bluffed and I read and I made it into a wonderful review. <laughs> And I don't know how I did it, but I did it. I just translated it. And, and he started to cry. And that's how much it meant to him. And I haven't seen that often with him. And he took me to the airport, and I went on the plane, and we never talked about it. Uh, never. I, I don't know if he, obviously, he must have read it, but we never talked about it. But that's how much it meant to him. And, and um, and he was told he wasn't socially interested. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how could they look at his movies and not recognize that and not see that. Uh, yeah, it was a very political moment. And I think he was criticized for being apolitical. Yeah, but he wasn't. Look at the movies he made. Look at the shame. You know, I think it's one of the best war movies I've ever seen. Maybe not the beginning because he didn't have the money to make a, a real bang, bang, bang movie. But he showed what happens to people. What happens to people? Something happens to them. It's, it's the, this, people are destroyed on the inside. Good people become bad people. How can they say he wasn't interested? Persona, several videos, TV glimpses from Vietnam, Passion of Anna, the same. How could they say that? It's, it's, sometimes it's what happens to people and people don't think that that is political. We should know, we should see, look at TV, what is happening with people, look at what they're saying and what they look like. That's what happens to people. And that's scary. Over here. This is completely different from a Bergman question, but I've always been curious to know how you came to make 40 carats. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody talked about that yesterday. Yes, we did, didn't we? Yes. And I thought nobody knew about 40 carats. You see, I, I wanted to be a Comedian. I always thought I could be a comedian, but I only got, you know, when I started to come to United States, they had only seen, you know, these sad, tragic people from, from Ingmar Bergman <laughs> movies and so. And so they gave me a comedian like 40 carats and everybody wanted it and I got it and I was only 31 years old and from Norway and with a very heavy accent and it this was to be a comedy and it was a 40 year old who gets in love with a 20 year old boy and I was 30 and the boy I fell in love with that was somebody who was 29 so that already wasn't <laughs> right and she was sophisticated from New York, and I have this kind of English language, and elegant, and I wasn't that elegant and whatever, but I got the movie, and I loved it. I really loved it, but it's kind of, and after that I got the comedy, which was also, you know, a, a musical, uh, Lost Horizons, and both was with Colombia, and Colombia almost went bankrupt <laughs> <laughs> with my two movies. But I, everybody was so nice, so <laughs> it was, it was uh, okay. But that was the closest I ever came to have a comedic uh, career, and then it was stopped. And then I went over to do my tragedies on stage and everything. And I don't understand it. And no, it's too late, you know. <laughs> Where's the, the light? Over here? Right. Oh, hey, Liv, it's so 
att du har kommit. Tack. Um, um, but I'm going to ask my question in English. So, um, what would you? How was working on the immigrants and how was working with Tru and, and your like castmates? It's obviously who like I, I know um, who you were playing the lead role with. You were. It's it's yeah. my. It's my favorite movie, The Emigrants and the New Lands, mm. uh, Land, and it's about uh, uh, emigrants from uh, much more than 100 years ago and why people have to leave, which are very often the same as today, where their home is more dangerous than the travel they are deciding to do. And these were Swedish emigrants going to United States. I loved the movie. Jan Trell made it. It was a very small group, and some of the actors, they were also part of the technical uh, crew. The, one of the brothers of my husband, Max von Sydow, he was also the sound engineer. Uh, and, and this man and, and woman, they loved each other, and they were together all their life, and I thought, how beautiful to be part of that, you know, one hand in one hand for the rest of your life. And they, and they came to United States, and, and it, was a, it was a beautiful story about uh, love. And it holds up, you know, if you haven't seen the immigrants and the new land, I think it's something one should look at today because uh, People have moved in so many years. It's not a surprise that they are moving today when the situation may be even worse, which is the reason where the ocean looks safer than your own home. Uh, and it, it holds up, the movie. And uh, I'm very proud of it. One final question, and then we're going to have to wrap this. Oh. I think it's just over here. Oh. Go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Um, Liv, uh, first I want to say I am a huge fan of yours, and as an, I know you are maybe a little bit tired of the Bergman questions by now, but I have another one to ask you, because uh, as, a, uh, as an aspiring filmmaker myself, his films have had such a huge impact on my life. So... What I want to ask you is, what was the most uh, profound experience of, uh, to come out from your relationship with Ingmar Bergman? Hmm. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a, bit I'm a bit anxious right now because I know I'm going to close this off. So. <laughs> what was the most? I, I would have to say my daughter. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. You've been tremendous. Thank you all. Fantastic audience.